started. Uh, appreciate the great turnout. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Midwest uh, Community Technical College in Granite Falls here for hosting us this evening, and uh, thank you, Dr. Galsworth, for being here and uh, help us with this uh, with this meeting. So, with that said, uh, we'll have our panelists here, and, and Chris will introduce them in just a minute. But I just wanted to talk a little about the ground rules for this evening. Uh, this meeting was called together by Chris and myself, and uh, we're very fortunate to have the folks here in the panel tonight, and this is to answer questions. People have a lot of questions that are coming to my office and Chris's office, wondering what's going on, wondering about this transition, and if it's been, what's been decided, and things like that. So we felt we'd host this informational meeting so that people can be here to ask questions. This is a meeting where you can ask questions, and I think we have a pretty good panel here that should be able to answer most of your questions. Well, I do want to remind people that we're going to keep this as a very respectful meeting, and we want this to be respectful through the whole evening. And uh, if, the, if we get a little rambunctious, try to keep it under control, and if the meeting gets out of hand, unfortunately, we will close the meeting up. And I don't want to do that, and Chris doesn't want to do that, and they know you people don't want us to have to do that. So let's keep this a very friendly meeting, and let's uh, get the information that we're looking for and be willing and free to ask questions, and that's what this is all about. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Chris, and he'll introduce the panel members. That was good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so we've got uh, Scott Romanat-Pelt, uh, Region 4 Director from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Why don't I just raise your hand as you go along? Ann Pierce, Parks and Trails Division Director from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Uh, ben Leonard, uh, Senior Director for the Historic Sites and Facilities Operations in the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, David Kelleher, Director of Government Relations from the Minnesota Historical Society. We have Kevin Gensel, uh, tribal, tribal Chairman of the Upper Sioux Community. David Chimelaski, Mayor of the Grand Falls. Um, John Barnes, uh, Commissioner of Yellow Medicine County as well. So, uh, you know, folks, if you just want to take a, a second just to introduce yourself a little bit um, in the capacity that you're in here, and then if we could uh, kind of maybe just start, uh, uh, maybe with the Historical Society and the DNR, just kind of to walk folks through just kind of just the general process of just how, if, if something like this is to move forward, just like real mechanics, kind of the the, 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 the back and forth of how something like this would even potentially even happen. Um, you know, just from transfers and whatnot. And, 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 and then we'll just kind of open up for questions and, and just as Gary mentioned, you know, just keep it uh, keep it calm, keep it, you know, we're, we're here together and we, we want to have a good conversation about this. So thanks everyone for coming. So that mic. Okay. Ah, okay, it is working. It is on. Great. Um, I'm Ann Pierce, and I'm the division director for Parks and Trails, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and Scott and I are here. I can stand up. Yeah, I don't know if that'll help. Um, uh, Scott and I are here to talk a little bit about the, the process that um, a that? Okay. That's what it was. Thank you. Closer? There. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Scott and I are here to talk a little bit about the process that any plan transfer um, of, of a park like this. And um, I don't know, I can pass it on to you, Scott. Wanna... All right, see if I can uh, keep it from squealing. I'm Scott Ringheld. I'm South Region Director for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. I work on behalf of Commissioner Stroman uh, with all seven DNR divisions in 32 counties. Uh, southern and southwest Minnesota. So, uh, I'll pass it on to Ben and then we'll talk a little more about process. Hi, I'm Ben Leonard with the Minnesota Historical Society and I represent uh, all historic sites and properties across Minnesota. 
Hi, I'm David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. I'm the Director of Government Relations. I work with um, Senator Dames and Representative Swazinski and various other state agencies. And as we talk through the process of a potential land transfer, uh, Ben and I can answer the historic site department. Uh, I've been in my position for five years. I've been in the region, the Sturgeon County area, for a while. And one of the roles that I've had for the last years is as a tribal liaison for the Department of Natural Resources. So, what that means is at least annually, uh, we get together uh, with leadership of the upper suit community, uh, we get together with leadership of the lower suit community, and we can talk and listen. And uh, one thing I think it's important to note is that in the 11 years that I've been meeting with the Upper Sioux community, uh, each year, uh, Chairman Jenswell has requested that Upper Sioux Agency State Park be returned uh, to the Yellow Medicine people, the Upper Sioux community. Switch out. All right, is this better? Okay. Uh, I've, I've got to say that uh, nothing really happened with those requests. Uh, we, we talked about the complexities involved. Uh, we talked about federal dollars that kept that land, in our opinion at the time, from being transferred. And it wasn't until recently um, that we've looked at many options for the park, uh, including a transfer, that we've dug deeper into what some of those details are. And uh, for now, I'll turn it over to Ann, and she can talk a little bit about those. Thanks, Scott. And um, I will let you know that I am just a little over a year in working with the Division of Parks and Trails. I have been with the DNR for 25 years, um, but was in a, a di different division at the time. So when I came to Parks and Trails, um, I had known that there had been conversation uh, with I think numerous um, governors with numerous commissioners, as Scott had said, throughout a number of years. And probably in the last five to six months, um, in those conversations, we had been saying it's a process, there's a number of steps, but not really exploring in great detail what that was. Over the last five to six months, we have started exploring that. One of the things that um, there are a number of people, a number of groups that are involved in a process for transferring land like this, and that would include the federal government, the state legislature, um, the, the Minnesota Historical Society, the Department of Natural Resources. Oh, you wanted everyone to? Sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm uh, John Behrens, Yale Medicine County Commissioner. My district is the uh, city of Grand Falls, just west of the uh, Minnesota River. I'm uh, Dean Spengluski. Um, pardon me, I am um, a speech difficulty. I am ill, as in it affects my speaking ability. Um, I'm here tonight as the chairperson of Friends for Upper Sioux Agency State Park, and uh, I am not speaking, nor have I ever said I was speaking for the City Council or the City of Grand Falls out of respect to them. I have not included my title as the mayor when I have spoken or written about this issue. I do not and cannot control how I am referred to in news stories about this. I have been criticized for this 
you know, want to make that very clear tonight that I am not speaking as the mayor here. Thank you. Let me talk to you a bit just to thank the Senator Dames and uh, Representative Swazinski for um, being here tonight, offering the Yellow Medicine people of the Upper Sioux community the opportunity to be here as well. I did ask uh, Representative Swazinski that um, it may be more appropriate if um, we make the initial comments based on the fact that it is through the efforts of the Upper Sioux community that um, this legislation is even has possibility of, of being um, enacted. And the reason I bring that up is um, I'm not a fan of social media. I don't participate, but um, it seems to have got people to pay attention. And um, I know that um, whether he says he's the mayor or the friends of the park, but um, Mayor Smigluski has been disseminating information, social media that I refuted the testimony in the State Senate as on behalf of the uh, Upper Sioux Friends of the State Park. He stated that it's only recently in the last few weeks that he was informed of uh, the intent of the uh, Upper Sioux community. And I only bring this up and I appreciate Representative Strzinski giving me the opportunity to, um, to at least give you an overview of what's occurred in the last 18 years. And uh, I don't know who's has to go to that fire, but um, be safe. Um, but this request is nothing new. And in 2005, I had talked with then Secretary Alita Gouget, and she made mention of the problems that um, the state park posed to our people. We would um, annually, we would have to request from the state legislator three days to hold our our annual Wachipi, our sacred celebration, summer celebration. And that request would have to be made to the state legislature and that's set wrong because the context of that park was historic tribal treaty land. That's a simple truth that just sits there. This can't be disputed, it can't be refuted. That was our land at one time. We've been in this river valley 10,000 years, long before the European ever came this land was taken care of by my mother's people. And so we had that discussion, and in order for her, she says, my relative sits there, and I see the family right here. His name is Mazomani. There's a big sign there that celebrates his death. It tells of a story of our interaction with the European people. The direct descendants are Upper Sioux Yellow Medicine members have to pay three dollars each and every time they wanted to go visit him. I see Mato Nupa over there and I appreciate I might have something to ask of him in a bit too if you give me that latitude. But these are historic problems. I don't know anybody in here who can raise their hand to say they have to pay to go visit their relative's grave. I don't see anybody in here you know having that difficulty that this, this park poses. That was the initial catalyst for why I was convinced and convicted that I would always bring this forth in three administrations, Paul Lenti, um, Dayton, and now to Governor Walls. Mayor Smigluski wears a lot of hats. One time he came to our, our, our homeland and he had a, had a camera and he asked why we moved our, our powwow grounds back to the reservation. It was on a Saturday in 2009, maybe 2010. I explained to him in great detail what I'm trying to just summarize for all of you right here, the problem that that park poses as it relates to our people. So for him to say as a human being, whatever hat that he wears, that he only had two weeks notice. I, I directly um, refute that. As far as um, his claim that the tribe and uh, the city have a cooperative nature, I have not received one phone call in official capacity from uh, the mayor 
or a city in 18 years that I've been here. The two interactions on behalf of the tribe with the Yellow Medicine County, one involved their, their um, complaint about us plowing on County Road 44 on their behalf and that we shouldn't do that for them free of charge. The other one was when one of their employees used their title to um, um, trespass onto tribal um, land and to um, uh, apply a pesticide and then utilize his title to, um, when he was caught doing that, to cover that up and to offer protection. These are truths I just lay there for you. Just to say that, that for people to say that they did not know. 16 months ago, we had a meeting with Representative Swadzinski on Zoom. Secretary Sabriego, who sits right here, and I believe all the rest of the council is here, participated in that meeting to tell them we had asked him to carry this bill on our behalf because now would be the time that we deemed appropriate. We were unable to make contact with Senator Daines or we would have asked of him the same request. The reason we chose that time, there were a lot of coincidences, if you will, and in my mother's language, we don't have a word for that. But the disrepair of the um, interpretive center, it is condemned. It is unsafe and unfit for human habitation, as well as the, the decommissioning of Highway 67, which dissected that park, which makes the eastern half a very limited accessibility. And in the near future, that bridge on the eastern side will be removed, and then it will isolate the eastern campground. So our request to the state, <clears throat> and if we leave the Upper Sioux community out of what that bill is requesting, there's $5.3 million that is requested on behalf of the state of Minnesota and their citizens to create a new place for recreation opportunities for the citizens of Minnesota and any guests to replace this park, which if you leave everything else aside, the condemnation of the building and the disrepair of, of the road, you know, only makes sense. If you couldn't support that for the replacement of that park, and I, and I know that recreation has been tossed around a lot tonight, in, in, in the past several weeks. As a tribe, we do not believe that that place should be viewed as a recreational land. It is a very solemn, historic and sacred piece of land that our people have lived on and occupied for 10,000 years. If anybody here can simply look at the truth, and I know Representative Swedzinski is a history major and look what occurred in 1862 on that piece of land. It was neither pretty or it was neither um, human-like and it was very, very important time in history that shaped where we're at today. We can, like I tell people, the truth just sits there and if we can't, it doesn't do anything, it, 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 it is. It is what it is, but if we cannot accept that in society today, to say that that's what occurred. I've been, um, somebody told me, well, we weren't there, you weren't there. No, we weren't. Not a one of us are responsible for what happened there, but all of us can be responsible for what happens moving forward. And the citizens of Minnesota can get a new recreational opportunity and some justice can be restored to the Dakota people and, 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 and as Mayor, Mayor uh, Smiglewski said about a win-win situation, I think that that's at least some semblance of, of, of being just and being fair. And so I, I welcome opportunity to all of you to give me a call directly. You know, you rely on social media and misinformation and disinformation. It does a disservice to all of us. I appreciate at least laying out the context of why we're here. I appreciate everybody being here you know, with all opinions and, and all, all viewpoints. So thank you, Senator Dames, from Jim Who we have? Thank you very much, Kevin.
Um, so thank you very much, Chairman Jenswell. Um, it was very elegant. And so we have been exploring what that process of, of transfer would look like. Um, again, there are partners in this, and I think um, sent Chairman Jenswell outlined the partners that are involved in this process uh, very nicely. And so as we move through that, one of the partners that we needed to discover what the process would be is the federal government. Um, there is involvement with what's called Land and Water Conservation Fund, and that is through the National Park Service and its grants that are given to states um, for various things that include uh, state park systems. That is under the Department of the Interior. And so we did have some communication with both the Land and Water Conservation Office and the National Park Service um, just to find out what is that process. There is a process in place. All this is written out in rule um, for transfer. And so part of what um, is laid out in transfer is some of what was mentioned that is, that is in the bill. So the 5.3 uh, million that is in the bill will allow us to um, use that money to help replace recreational values that the park holds. And then there is also the, um, the, the value of the land. And so that is a piece that is in the bill and that is a process that um, we will work through to uh, work with the local community to figure out what those um, values are, where we can replace those values, and make sure that um, the process is followed um, and that this is something that both the governor and the Department of Natural Resources feels is the right thing to do. Before you uh, say your case, we just answer your name. I guess there's support. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is Scott Raymeld. Uh, just a, something to add is, is, you know, there's bills introduced on in both the House and the Senate, and they mention transfer. And our understanding is that those are process bills. Uh, one of the things that they require is that the DNR submit a report by December 15th. And one of the things that that report needs to do is identify any obstacles to transferring the park along with possible legislative solutions to those obstacles. And so over the coming months, that's going to be one of our responsibilities. And along with that, uh, we're going to be looking at, at public engagement, uh, speaking to different groups uh, that have different interests uh, with the park. And well, we don't have that in place yet, just because things have been moving quickly, uh, it's something that we plan to do. This is Ann Pierce again. And I think also working with different groups on that public engagement is something that we want to also do. Thank you, man. Uh, ben Leonard, Minnesota Historical Society. I wanted to just give a brief um, history about the state historic site, just so everyone's clear. Um, historic site stewardship uh, was transferred to the Minnesota Historical Society from the DNR in 1969. And it really refers to just 19.3 acres of the park. Uh, and the agency building structure that you see there today uh, was constructed uh, on the historic foundation in the early 1970s. So that's not, uh, it's, a, it's a historic recreation, but it is not an original, the original agency building, uh, which did not survive um, 1862. And uh, currently, uh, the Upper Sioux Agency State Historic Site is one of five state historic sites that is held for preservation, so we don't advertise it open to the public. I'm going to hand over to David Keller. Thanks, Ben. David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. 
Um, before we get to questions, I just want to emphasize a couple of things that, that um, Dean and our colleagues said. The legislation that's moving through the legislative process calls for our two organizations to report back to the legislature by December 15th, as Scott said, with a list basically of issues and legal hurdles and other things that we need to solve. So we are early in this process. There's a lot that we do not know. There's a lot that, particularly with the walk-on process, that we need to sort out. Uh, we've got some experience doing walk-on conversions, but it requires reviews by other agencies like the State Historic Preservation Office in addition to the National Park Service. So at this point, if we're gathering information, we're trying to learn more about what would have to happen next, um, whether there would be further legal restrictions, further legislation that would be required, further studies. So again, it's early for we're all in this learning process together. <coughs> So this is Ann Pierce again. I think um, that is the basic process that, you know, from a facilitated standpoint, that um, from an administrative standpoint, we would need to follow. There's lots of unknowns for us also, and those are the things we'll be discovering as we go throughout the next 10 months. Um, so I think, I'm not sure what the next... So, so next what we'll do is we'll open it up for questions. So if you have a question, if you would stand up, then Robin will bring the mic over to you and we can get the mic, state your name, and then just state your question. And as we get into the questions, uh, if the question's been asked, ask, try not to ask it again because there's going to be a lot of questions and we got a short amount of time to go through it. So with that said, I'll hand the mic to Robin. And it looks like the first gentleman is right over there. Oh, no, no. Kevin? Um, I just, about the administrative process, I just wanted to share with all of you that the uh, Upper Sioux community um, has secured on behalf of the state of Minnesota a assurances from the National Park Service to um, offer consideration and exception to a one-year timeline. Those dollars that were initially utilized to purchase the park come with a, a one-year restriction if it's ever conveyed. So we traveled to Washington, D.C. and were able to secure that letter. We do have a copy. I apologize. It's out in my truck. I had to park, you know, halfway to Montevideo to get here. But, <laughs> but that, that, that assurance was being given to afford the state opportunity to not hastily have to find that replacement land, again, with the more um, local engagement. You know, there may be a better opportunity closer closer to uh, uh, Granite Falls and the Yellow Medicine County area here as well. And that was our concern as well, to make sure that uh, we could have more than just that single year. And so that's what we achieved on behalf of the state. So a lot of that homework's been done, and that legwork's been done by the tribe to make sure that that happens. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, questions? Uh, we'll take that young lady right there. Is this better? Yeah. Did you catch that? No. All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Great. 
great. How's this? Just troubleshooting for the group. <laughs> Hi, my name is Danny. Uh, I'm a relatively new member of the community of Granite Falls. I've only lived here about three years less, um, and I'm still learning. And I thanked Chairman Jensel for his incredibly eloquent summary of an enormous amount of complicated information, a lot of which I personally wasn't previously privy to. Um, I have a lot of questions for our local community and local relationships, and I, I will save those. Um, my primary questions, I think, are for the Historical Society, the DNR, and my uh, representatives, which is, it sounds like there's an enormous amount of communication breakdown with the local community, and I'm curious what pathways you have for communication from the federal to state and state level down with the local community and our U.S. governmental system and how that type of communication works. Um, and I have questions for the Historical Society about how information about the historic nature of this place, regardless of access to the land itself, um, given that I've been out there and the, the information that I've seen is incredibly limited, uh, both in its breadth and its scope and its upkeep. And so I'm curious about how the history of this place will be better communicated to the population all the way around, regardless of the outcome of the park. So my questions are really about communication. So this is Ann Pierce for those that are in the other room. Um, I think as far as the communication going forward, we're, we are committed to communicating with the local community and others that this park is important to because, of course, there's others in Minnesota and cross country also who come to this area. And we have, are in the process of developing a communications plan. And again, I think um, last week, Scott and I were invited to the county board meeting, which was great. And we're also committed to working with the local community leaders in engaging with us in that. Um, engagement process and communication process moving forward. Yeah, that, uh, that's an in-depth question. Um, I encourage everyone to learn this history. This is really important history that, uh, that belongs to all of us that we all need to know. Um, I encourage everyone to reach out to the Upper Sioux community and the Lower Sioux community because they are the best served to tell their story. And we partner with the Lower Sioux Indian community at the Lower Sioux Agency, and we have since 2009, and that's a really special experience for visitors to be able to go to that site and learn from community members that history. Uh, we have other state historic sites. You can go to Birch and Lee. You can go to Lockheed Bar Mission. You can go um, across the Minnesota River Valley. You can go to partner organizations, um, like I mentioned, or other uh, entities that are also telling the history. The city of Byway has interpretive panels. Uh, we're in a process right now at the Historical Society for redoing all of our interpretive panels across the entire network. So I think we're putting up like 28 uh, panels at Lower Sioux. And, um, you know, I think. Besides going to historic sites, read some books. Uh, this is complicated history. Read seven books. Uh, we publish uh, books and we provide uh, opportunities for experts and speakers to share their history. And I think that's really important. There's a, a lot of them. And just from a you know a state of Minnesota legislative standpoint, you know that's what this meeting's honestly about. So there's been a couple of bills that have been uh, introduced and passed, and actually moving through the process. Um, and, and you know in the past, you know for the last 16 years, this has been a conversation that's happened in the background, always of potential. But in reality, you know this year it, it, it appears that those things are really growing legs and have the potential of moving forward. And so you know Senator Dames and I felt that it was important because there hasn't been a whole lot of reach out as far as a meeting potentially like this uh, because the likelihood of it happening wasn't there and 
now it is. And so uh, Senator Davis and I felt that it was necessary to at least host an, at least an inaugural meeting to kind of lay the groundwork that this is a conversation that is happening. This is a conversation that is potentially moving forward. And, and it's important to hear the voices of, of all the communities involved. And so you know, that's what we're here for today. And I think that's important. And uh, there we go. I think we have some other questions. Just, uh, this is Chairman General. I wanted to comment on we're talking about history and reading books and doing this and that. Um, there's also tribal history as to what that land represents, what occurred there, and of how it is viewed today. And I mentioned earlier that the uh, truth just sits there. I also mentioned that 1862 events that occurred there, none of us were there, so none of us participated or, 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 or could be blamed for that. But there's one word I guess I'll put out there, and it might be received, and it might not be received well, but um, I do know there's educated people in here, many, many degrees, and, and, and I'm proud to say many of those are tribal members with knowledge of history. And, now, I, I bring up the word and, and uh, why I brought up Amato Nupa because I was reminded of a conversation uh, or a discourse, I should say, that occurred between, I believe, Amato Nupa and the Granite Falls paper at the time. Again, a lot of hats being worn. I, I believe uh, Dave Smigluski was the editor of that paper at the time. But our history and how we reflect and review that place is one of um, genocide. And if we cannot, as society today and human beings, look back and say that that's what occurred, then we're only prolonging this, this, this divisiveness that occurs as part of our, our history. But Mato Nopa wrote a letter to the, the, the Granite Falls paper and the, the editor refused to publish that letter because it contained the word genocide. Now, I don't know how many years ago that was, but for us as, as human beings, each and every one of us created by God to, to not acknowledge that it is problematic in today's, in today's environment. And so when we talk of history, and it doesn't come from the books, it comes from humanity, and the things that occurred there were horrendous, ambitious. They don't belong to us. And if we can change the narrative, I think that that would be the greatest thing that we could all leave that legacy for our children, our grandchildren. And I just bring that about history. It is, it is, it is viewed in two different ways, and somewhere in the middle is what actually occurred. But that is what we say that occurred. And to dispute that, we can offer lots of documentation to, to say that um, what we're, um, that definition has been met, that criteria. Oh, my God, you are being. Oh, I see, Chante was there, and I bet you use a video. In the language of the first Minnesotans, the Dakota people of Minnesota, Makoche. That's a greeting, which means, hello, my relatives, with a good heart, I greet all of you with a handshake. The, uh, I've got the chairman brought up the topic of history that was brought up by some of the panelists here. And I want to say, too, that, uh, that uh, Dave Smigluski here, uh, I, uh, I wrote several letters to the editor, or articles, for or columns for the paper, and he and a young man, I forgot what his name is, uh, they just uh, denied the words I use, like genocide, like uh, concentration camps, like broken treaties, all of this is pertinent to this area. And I'm hoping that uh, if Dave Spigrusi can accept those words, and he, 
they so they deleted words like genocide and concentration camps. And he doesn't know a damn thing about any of them. I'm a little bit I'm pretty knowledgeable about indigenous nations history, pretty knowledgeable about biblical studies, having gone, studied, and also attended a seminary, and uh, pretty knowledgeable about genocide, having spent seven or eight years with the International Association of Genocide Scholars and speaking all over the world, talking about the genocide of the Dakota people of Minnesota Makoche and talking about the genocide of the indigenous peoples of the United States. That's a reality, plenty of documentation, but our leaders, like Smiglewski, uh, and academics, and probably here, some of them that they teach history here, they don't want to talk about those things because it makes them uncomfortable. And besides that, it's damning to the United States of America and damning to the U.S. Euro-American society because all of them were complicit in, in perpetrating those heinous, barbaric acts. So I just uh, I just that's something to comment that I wanted to uh, wanted to make as well. And then massive the main comment I wanted, I wrote a, just about a single page and a half of. Uh, comments that I was going to make, but I just wanted to mention the massive land theft that occurred here. So I, I don't know, I think that according to my uh, my daughter is here, Dr. Lucia Dewey, she wrote a book, What Does Justice Look Like? And uh, I think Minnesota has about 54 million acres. And it, all of that is Dakota land. And it's stolen Dakota land. It's land that has not been paid for. And I don't know what some of you people who go to Christians, go to the Lutheran Church, I mean, we got three of them here, I guess, and uh, we'll go to the Catholic Church or go to the Baptist Church. I don't know what you guys think about that. Like massive land theft, about three billion acres stolen by the United States government and its Euro-American citizenry, settlers, farmers, ranchers, and, uh, and nobody thinks anything at all, and not paid for. Like, I think that violates one of your cap rules of capitalism when you can exchange a product that you, uh, that you uh, pay for or make some terms of payment. So anyway, it looks like I'm, I'm going to be uh, <coughs> silenced now. So but anyway, when history is mentioned, Minnesota Historical Society, and some of the leaders, I hope you pay attention to Dakota history. Well, thank you for your words. You're not being silenced. We just have other people that may want to speak to, so that's all. So, thank you. <coughs> My name's Tom Caving, and I grew up in Morton, Minnesota, Lower Sioux Reservation. And you will be involved with a tale of three parks. Ramsey Park was given to the city of Redwood because there was a lot of discontent about how the state was running it. I grew up on the interior of Birch Cooley Park. The state, the state built a road across the battlefield, which made it a very difficult three-quarter mile driveway. And then it was given to the Historical Society. I appreciate the comments that were made earlier about the disrepair of the buildings here. I was an employee of the Historical Society in 1971 doing archaeological digs around those buildings the summer of my freshman year in college. We have 80 acres of conservation land immediately adjacent to Birch Cooley. And my daughter and one of my sons want the will to read that it goes back to the Lower Sioux community. I have two classmates from Morton Grade School whose great grandfathers were hung in that cave. <coughs> hung in the largest mass genocide hanging in the history of our country. And the DNR's management of Birch Cooley was deplorable. When you talk about new signs, the Historical Society in Renville has been asking for sign repair and benches for the trail. Perhaps that resource might be better maintained. I have one question for the reservation community. 
Will any of the resource be available? Because not only did I dig there, but I've camped at the campground on the river several times. And I have one other question for the DNR. What are you, where are you proposing to create something similar to the park? Thank you. So um, that is what our engagement process will look at. We don't have, um, you know, we, we have kind of a list of what's in the area and what might be added on to, things like that. But that is what that public engagement process will look at, is I where we can recreate well, yeah, that. I'm a former first sergeant, so you all fail to hear me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your question, sir. Um, that's one of the questions that posed many, many times to us. And, you know, as a tribal council, we haven't really come to terms with the potential that exists that's in front of us at the moment. But we do know this. It will be treated in a respectful and solemn manner for all people to remember what occurred there and, and to make sure that it's memorialized in an accurate way. And, um, again, treated in a respectful manner because we truly don't agree with the, this term recreation as it applies to that land. And that is one of our biggest um, difficulties we have is that um, I, I made testimony at the Senate, or I believe at the House, I says, I want to leave you with a picture in the same place that people are there having a Sunday picnic, smiling and, and having a wonderful time is the same place where our ancestors were starved to death, where the children and the old people, you know, ultimately died at, at that place. So if you could at least accept that, uh, that as, as, as something you can relate to, you will see why it shouldn't be a place of recreation, but should be a place of reverence. That's as far as we're at right now, but we do welcome, you know, all 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 um, comments and um, any anybody wants to reach out to us because again we're unsure of uh, what shape and what form that that place is going to you know ultimately become. So maybe what we could do should we just have people line up? Yeah, maybe just if you want to come. If you have a question or comment, just come and line up because otherwise we don't know who was first or second or third. Yeah, second the gentleman in the back will be up next. I just want to speak. I'm not an officer. I'm just an enlisted man, but I carry a diamond. And when they talk about acquisition, I understand about acquisition and procurement on beans and bullets. But when they talk about acquisition of land, uh, they've already got a county park that they supposedly have acquired funds for near my property on the Minnesota River where the confluence of the Chippewa, Palm de Terre, Minnesota, and Yellow Madison rivers are coming together. I don't know about it, but I see two of my neighbors sued the county already. I understand there might be a settlement in the process. So don't, when they say that they're forward coming, that isn't necessarily true. But since I'm a businessman also, and I have a gravel pit next to it, they should have at least informed me about it. But so there is acquisition coming, and they are looking for procurement of the land. So uh, when you're looking at this park, some of those people are going to be affected when they uh, decide to allow this park to take place. And there's other people that I've talked to here. They're wondering how they're going to get to their land if they turn this land over. So there's other things to be discussed.
Hello, everyone. My name is Marcy Bracken. I'm a relatively new resident of um, Grand Falls, Grand Falls Township. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone here and hear everyone speaking. Can you talk into the mic? Thank you. There's been a lot of talk about process and communication. I want specifics. I want to know if people are just supposed to, where they're supposed to go, who gets this information. Uh, is it organizations you're going to listen to? Is it individuals? Is it by invitation? We need specific process guidelines for communication. Please. Scott Raymill, DNR. Um, we have been looking at a process. We've been designing a process. And when this legislation was introduced, it, it took things from zero to 120 miles an hour. And so we're still trying to play catch up right now. And so we don't know the right groups. Uh, when we talked to the, the county commissioners, we asked for their assistance in helping us figure out some of those right groups to talk to, the right people to talk to, the right timing to talk. Um, so if you've got thoughts on that, um, you know, share those with your county commissioners. Uh, and let us know. And just wanted, to, like I've said before, we are going to, the engagement process will be a variety of different things, but we will work with, um, for the, the local engagement, we will work with the local leaders to design an engagement process that um, will help get to all the people that want to have um, conversation about what the next steps are through this process. Again, I truly don't think that there is any land that has the same conditions and experiences and history as, as the uh, Upper Sioux State Park. Again, not only because of the historical context it represents the Dakota people, but again, because of the, the uh, condemned building and as well as the access that's been cut off. I mean, I know that um, the County Commissioner had made reference to other state parks and this and that. And again, our argument and, and, and our position is is we are focused on, on this piece of, of land solely because of its of historical um, meaning to our people. And um, for that, we, are, we have focused our efforts on that. I, I think that um, there are arguments that are made that sometimes create hysteria. I do remember one time we tried to um, transfer a, a right of way to the state of Minnesota and they tried to transfer one to us and it was against their laws so they had to add three words or tribal nation to, to, to transfer a 66 foot right of way to the tribe. And part of those discussions I believe was about four hours on the Senate floor about how many um, tribes were going to 
the 200 and some thousand acres of 66 foot right away is how many casinos they were going to put on that. So again, we, we lose focus on what, what, what is truly um, the discussion here tonight. Our focus is, is on this state park and its specific um, attachment to the Dakota people. The Yellow Medicine River was named after our people. This county was named after our people. We've been here long before and we, you know, we're not going to go anywhere. We are good neighbors. We, we, are, we are catalysts and, 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 and promoters of, of uh, this local economy. And um, we're not focused anywhere else but right here in our homeland of this Minnesota River Valley. Anyone from the DNR want to speak up to that question? Um, I will just support what Chairman Jenswell um, commented on that, you know, his eloquent communication about the importance of this land. Um, you know, the governor and the DNR um, think this is the right thing to do, and we're focused on this transfer. It, ha it has unique history. Hello, my relatives. This is a good hearty greet all of you with a handshake in English. My name is Autumn Cavender. Uh, I am a member of the Upper Sioux community um, here just outside of Grand Falls. Um, and um, I also live, though, off reservation, about a mile south of town, uh, though my, my address officially says that I am a resident of Grand Falls. And I think this is important because as we talk about representation um, and communication and what that ha where those communication breakdowns occur, it's really important to remember that I think of many people in this room, we all have addresses technically within, the city, within Granite Falls, right? Or most of us, all of our addresses say Granite Falls. Well, sorry, not most of us, my bad. A lot of us in the local area. Personally, I really would have appreciated a representative from the Tribal Historic Preservation Office on this panel because I think that they would have been really able to speak uh, to um, a lot of the other questions that a lot of us have in the room. But unfortunately, uh, it's my understanding that there wasn't room on the panel or space wasn't made for a member of the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. In my opinion, if there's a place to direct ire or frustration regarding lack of communication, it's definitely the state representatives and at the local municipal um, municipal uh, authorities as well who have known about Upper Sioux Community's desire to obtain the state park for several years and for some reason just simply failed to take that seriously enough to inform their constituents who now have questions about that in this room. Um, I have had the honor of walking concentration camp sites around the world and sites of genocide, sites of uh, major cultural exploitation. And I know for a fact that they are not treated as recreational sites globally. They are treated as places of solemn remembrance of the things that have happened there and of the people who died. I think that's really all any of us have ever asked for uh, in regards to the historic nature, to the spiritual nature, to the ceremonial nature of the site. Um, I am fully in support of the transfer of the land to, um, to the tribal community in this regard. I am also really super excited about the acquisition of the replacement acres, and I'm really hoping that that is placed in a local place, um, somewhere that we can all have access to, because access to green space and, um, and like active, restored environmental space, particularly in the, in the site of like major ecological devastation, is really important for all of us. We all want wild places to be out. We all want wild places to see and interact and be on, on good earth that's not contaminated, restored prairie, restored open forests. Um, so I'm really excited about the possibilities of, of, what is, of what is possible for our local ecology through the acquisition of new acres. It is my question to the DNR and to the tribe to what extent that they would be willing to use the Grand Portage model and co-manage the uh, newly acquired acreage after this land transfer has been made. We'll be there, Chichia. Thank you, thank you, Chang uh, Pico. Again, the tribal discussions haven't evolved to that, that degree yet, but again, our focus is, is getting that return to the Dakota people, you know, and, and you know, from a spiritual context, the, the Wakantaka is going to make sure that it is treated in a proper manner. 
again, I, I do remember, recall that in the social media put out there, you know, by uh, the mayor that talked about the Grand Portage model, one thing that just conveniently overlooked is, is that land is um, uh, tribal land up there. It, it is not um, state land, it is not DNR land. It is, it is leased to the uh, state of Minnesota and the DNR for $1 a year for um, their assistance with uh, that tribe to um, make that park available, my understanding. Okay. We have other folks in the line? My name is Jessica Dipsetter. Um, I'm quite nervous, so I'm sorry. I'm a little shaky. Um, mine is mostly a comment that you don't do the right thing because you stand to gain something, and you don't choose not to do it because you stand to lose something. Um, I'm somebody who enjoys using state park land and has visited there, um, but as somebody with a grandfather who was uh, a prisoner of war during World War II, I can also say that those past events aren't just history. Um, they're very much present for people here in the, yeah, sorry, uh, in the present. And I feel we have an opportunity to do the right thing here and return this land. Um, and then for those of us who are concerned about accessing you know, outdoor spaces and accessing um, land for recreation, I feel like it's a win-win situation because if you're a Minnesotan who appreciates having green space and protected space, this gives us an opportunity to have even more protected space within our state that's going to be you know, managed in ways that promote wildlife, promote green space, promote um, natural spaces. So I guess my question is, can you just clarify whether it's sort of a like a one-to-one -one in terms of the amount of space. Like, you know, would we have access to sort of an equal or comparable <coughs> amount of space in another location? I'm sorry for all that. <laughs> so the the process actually requires the value of the land, so that clearly would depend on where you are replacing that land, right? So those are, that that level of kind of, do we know if it'll be the exact amount or not? I think that will depend on what our engagement process looks like, what the values we're trying to replace are, and where that property is. Good evening. My name is Dominic. I'm a resident here for about 10 years. Use the state park quite a bit and other natural resources in the area. I think I speak for everybody. We've heard a lot of impact statements in the fourth transfer group. I'm not here to provide one either way, but I would like to hear from the representatives and the panel how you stand on the transfer of the land. And if you're against, I would like to understand and have the group understand what actions you're gonna to take to uh, see your side of that come through. And if you're for, we'd like to hear the reasons why, right? So we can start with all of you or any of you. Well, I'll, I'll start, I'll take this one. I have not, uh publicly stated where I'm going to stand on this. And the reason I haven't is I'm just like a lot of you in this room. I want to find out all the details. I want to know exactly what's going to happen and how this is going to happen. I just found out about this about uh, less than a month ago. And so uh, that's one of the reasons we decided to have this meeting, Chris and I, is because we've been hearing a lot about questions about this situation. What's going to happen? How's it going to work? Is it going to happen? And I can tell you in the Minnesota Senate right now, this bill has went through the, uh, it went through the, or the uh, Environmental Committee, from the Environmental Committee, it went to the uh, uh, Transportation Committee, now back to the Environmental Committee, and so I'm expecting it'll probably be in the omnibus bill. I don't know where it's at in the House. The bill does have to pass through both the House and the Senate, and it has to pass off both floors, be sent to the governor for his signature. We know how the governor stands on it. And I just answered it. Thank you. 
you know, I, you know, I, what's that? Anyway, uh, Chris Wazinski, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we had this meeting is it's exceptionally important. Um, you know, I'm, as a conservative, very concerned about the state acquisition of land and how it impacts our communities, but also, you know, how is, if land is no longer within the state bounds, how is it dispersed? And, you know, one of the things that we're talking a lot about is a state park. And this is not necessarily a piece of CRP. It's got historical backgrounds. It's got, you know, a lot of history behind it. But it also has a lot of community from the past, but it also has community from today. And I think maybe the solution isn't the one that we were given. You know, is a, you know, it was mentioned here with the question you asked, is a, is a co, uh, is a co-management. To clarify, my comments were about the replacement acres, not sure. the return of upper Sure, but anyway, I mean that's our day. That's what we're here for, right? Is you know, if, if, do we believe that you know, is there a one size fits all for this? Is the transfer of this land the absolute answer? <coughs> I don't know, but are there other options? You know, is the DNR open for it? Is the governor open for it? Are the tribes open for it? That would get to the place where there could be peace in the management of the land, because obviously, you know. Uh, Chairman Jensvold's words of saying, you know, hey, if I have to spend, spend three dollars to visit the grave of my ancestor, I don't think anyone would say that's the right thing to do, right? But at the end of the day, we are all Minnesotans. And this is a shared history that we all do have. Some of it up to 150 years ago and up to, to 150 years ago into today. And you know, I think we need to have real conversations about this stuff. And, I, and I'm thankful for these uh, folks that are coming forward. But um, you know, from a real standpoint, that's what we need. To, that's what we need to have. Be honest about it. You know, I, I want to thank the gal that came up here very nervously and uh, shared. And that's important to do. And uh, you know, I think uh, you know, there's no sealed deal by any means because there's legislative action. And there's folks in this room that are for 100% transfer. There's in, folks in this room that are 100%, we shouldn't be doing a darn thing here. I believe there's something in the middle, right? That's what being community members is all about. Take it down to the state park and make it land for everybody to celebrate and talk about history with the chairman. Well, I don't know, but there is history there and it's important history and it's not good history, right? right. It's stuff that's bad, right? Like I mentioned a couple times before, both the governor and the Department of Natural Resources support the transfer. Yeah, and I, I'll just add, this is Scott Raymond. Uh, we're in the business of protecting land for public use. Uh, it, it's very rare that we feel otherwise about a piece of public land. Uh, most parks, pieces like that are protected because of rare and natural resources. One of the things that make this situation unique is the reason this was protected was because of the Upper Sioux Agency. It, it wasn't about the resources itself, it's about what occurred there. If I could expound on that, um, that mm -hmm. park would probably not exist uh, prior or after 1990 and the NAGPRA acts of federal government that they probably would have never supported it with dollars just because it is such a historically significant cultural uh, 
we call it TCPs, tribal cultural properties. I mean, they would not have funded the purchase of that property in after 1990. So um, that's been made clear to 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 us in our conversations that it, it, and why they even the federal government even bothered to consider making exceptions for the state to have additional time for replacement land is because of the uniqueness of what it represents. Do you have another question or was that it? But historical society? I have a couple of questions. Um, the first for the DMR. Under legislation, your role is to provide connection to state lands. If you transfer the property to a community of less than 600 people, how do you defend that it will, it will essentially close to all Minnesotans and other visitors that are not welcome on that property by the tribe? So um, what I laid out previously is not that there is a loss of those values, but there is a replacement of those values. If I could make comment to you, Miss, about uh, this uh, perception of a community of less than 600 people, understand that we are a federally recognized uh, sovereign nation, you know, with at least uh, equal sovereign to the state of Minnesota and every 49 other states that there are. That's been acknowledged by the United States of America in the Constitution that exists for all of us. So we are unique, not considered just a community because of our our United States Bureau of Indian Affairs names. We are killer medicine people. So um, that, that is a distinction that needs to always be remembered regardless of, of how many people we are. You know, it is irrelevant to the conversation. My next question is to the Historical Society. The Historical Society is a nonprofit organization that is not to take sides in this situation. However, uh, you have a Native American Initiatives Department whose director has stated full support to the tribe and all of the resources MNH has, as MNH has. has. How will you go about being fair and being at providing adequate notification to the Department of Administration's Office of the State Archaeologist and the State Historic Preservation Office with regard to all issues relating to the historic preservation and the historic site of the property, being that many consider it a site of genocide on both sides, both of Dakota people and of European people. David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. Um, a couple of questions in there, and then I'll get back to your question. Um, we're so we're concerned specifically with the uh, 19 acres that's the historic site out of the entire parcel of here. So we're speaking only to that piece of it. Um, as far as the first question, our our position on this, we're relatively late in the game to this. Um, we have a governing board that has not taken a position on this, but I will say that uh, we have dedicated ourselves to working with the Upper Sioux community, the DNR, and any local folks are, who are interested in this. Our track record is uh, working with communities in the Minnesota River Valley, the Lower Sioux community, where we previously had done a land transfer uh, to ensure that some of the lands that were important to that community went back to that. As far as the question about how will we work with the Department of Administration and the State of Historic Preservation Office, one of the, this is getting a little bureaucratic, so bear with me. Um, one of the things with the WACON transfer is that that's a federal action, a federal undertaking. So that will kick in a 
Historic Preservation Review, and at that point, the State Historic Preservation Office will do a review of that to make sure that uh, historic resources are considered and studied extensively. So that's on the long list of things that we have to explore further and learn more about how that would work. the Lower Sioux Agency was placed on the lands bill in the legislation uh, with the bill authored by Senator here. It just kind of seemed to flow through and the public wasn't involved in any way, shape, or form even after there was public outcry against the transfer taking place. Is this meeting just an exercise in futility to make it seem as though the public will be heard and everyone that is an actor here has already taken a side with the removal of the historic site from the historical society's perspective and from the DNR's perspective, the removal of all camping opportunities for online reservations being removed as of July 31st this year. So I'm not, <clears throat> I'm trying to piece into part of that question. I think, you know, the department, this meeting was thankfully organized by the representative and the senator. Um, again, we will engage with the community on the replacement pieces of this. There is legislation in um, the House and the Senate right now that is moving through the reflection of camping and the availability of camping has to do with a variety of things, including where you can get to in the park and things like that. So I think there's a lot of things in that question. Um, and I'm, I tried to answer most of those, but I don't know if I got it all. David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. Um, the other piece that Ann mentioned is the legislative process, and and that's a very public process, and this bill had hearings in both House and Senate Environment Committees, and, and making a reference back to the 2017 bill uh, with the Lower Sioux Agency transfer, land transfer, same thing. That had hearings in the House and Senate, it was included in a lands bill that had a very public process. The legislature does get the last word on this. As far as the historic site and state lands, uh, the legislature can control what's what's added or taken away from the list of historic sites. So that's really where some of the action is in the legislative process. I have a question for everyone in this room, and before I ask that, I would like to introduce myself. Matakiapi, Shante Washe Nape Chiyuzapi, Dakota Ya Wichinchala Makiapi. My name is Wichinchala. I do not go by my English name. It serves no purpose to me. The question that I want to ask, and I have numerous questions, is why is white fragility and privilege being held higher than reparations? And I'm asking every single person in here, because we are so focused, and I mean very focused, on what they are losing as benefits, because I don't see anybody glamping at Auschwitz. I don't see anyone fishing over there or trying to visit, because they understand that it is an awful place where things horribly happened, and it is set to be a memorial. So I am so confused, because as someone who has direct ascendancy 
from people who were in the 1862 Dakota War and were forced to march in exile to Fort Snelling. My great grandmother was a child. She was a baby. She could have easily died. There was a woman whose baby was ripped from her arms and was bashed against a stone and then placed in the trees. This is the aftermath of the war that you guys want to glorify and take advantage of. So I am just so curious as to why reparations is not important here for the community members of Granite Falls because I do see this community committee saying something. I do see them saying their stances. But I'm so confused on why the white people in our community are trying to be colonizers still. Why are we not focusing on reparations? Why is that not a focus? If we want a better community, we need to be better community members. And that means acknowledging the horrible things that have happened and acknowledging reparations whether it is in the form of land back. And land back does not just mean we give all the land back like so many people think. It means that indigenous peoples have autonomy over the land that they were given to once by Tunkashiwa. Not land that was stolen and ripped apart and lied for. This, um, this country is built off of slavery and genocide and y'all are trying to continue the perpetration of that. So those are my comments, and those are my questions for the community. I don't think I'm going to comment on that. Somebody else would like to say you can. I think you made a, a good statement, ma'am, and I think you uh, anybody else has any questions? Did you have a question? Come on. I want to know. Um, I'm, I'm Emmy Lipke. I'm, I grew up here in Granite Falls. I used the park many times for trail riding. Um, it's a beautiful place. We've always respected it as trail riders in this community and other people from around the state, the, even the country. People have come from out of state to trail ride in the yellow in the upper Sioux Agency State Park. Um, to say that that we don't respect the land is not correct. We may not go and um, go to your grave site that, that you're talking about, but we we have learned a lot of history in the park through riding in there and um, communicating with other people uh, that know the history. One of them was my father, who has, has passed on, but he knew a lot of the history. Uh, his name was Ernest Strike. Um, many people um, would know him. Um, he was on, I think, the, um, the battlefield, Woodlake Battlefield um, uh, Memorial in there. I think that one time. Um, but anyway, I just want to say that just because we are white people, as you might want to say, um, it does not mean that we do not respect the park or the land. <laughs> and, um, I want to say to the, to the community, the, um, the Indian community is just please help teach your history. Why, why don't you teach your history a little bit more? You don't have to go through the Granite Falls paper. There's many ways to teach the history of your people. And it was horrible what happened. It, it was horrible. It was horrible. It was a horrible time in the history of Minnesota. And um, I think it just, I, I agree, it needs to be said by both, by all sides. And I think um, closing the park off to um, the general public is a way to close off the communication and um, the way to um, learn more about the history of the area and what happened. I do have a question also. Um, the reservation itself, is it, uh, it is, is the land, is that all of the land that was included in the treaty? <laughs> no, okay. no, 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 no. What other land is, it, is should be included or is included in the treaty? I'm asking because people are saying. It's really none of your business. It's the history yourself. 
Since, since the legislators and the bureaucrats are here to I, I, see the census, yes, could you do a at poll? At least as a reference to the 1851 Traverse to Sioux Treaty, that land that represents seven one hundred thousandths of one percent of the original 21 million acres of that land that was um, reserved by the Dakota people forever. Anybody living 10 miles either side of the river from New Orleans to Big Stone, if you look at the title and your abstract, the very first owner, it will say Dakota Indian. As far as the, the comment or the question about um, telling our history and telling, uh, I've been in this world almost 59 years. I've had opportunity to to push the envelope, if you will, and try to engage people from my mother's perspective. My father's full blood Norwegian, you know, but from my mother's perspective and her family. And always at the end of any conversation, I should say always because that's too definitive, but many times at the end of the conversation when I try to explain a portion of history or an abstract thought, the comment will be, yeah, but. And this is where it gets lost on the European and any of the other immigrants, is that there's always this alternative that would fit a narrative that is more comfortable. And that is the, the difficulties that, that I've faced in my lifetime. I have many friends in this room. I have many friends in, in this world, you know, and, and I, I don't see that color. I've tried to leave that out. Because in the teachings I've learned over all of these years, you know that that is the, to the detriment of all of us to, to make that claim. But that is why it's very difficult to, to teach our history because it's always viewed from somebody else's perspective to try to make it fathomable and acceptable to them. And that is just an just a experience I want to share. I want to say good evening to all the relatives. Uh, my name is Claudia Garcia, and I'm the of the people of the uh, Wiradica, and I live on the occupied lands of the Wapakute Dakota in Fairville. So I am a taxpayer and a Minnesota resident, and I want to say that I'm in full support of the transfer, of the land transfer. 20% of the land that is held by the indigenous people that they steward it's 80% of the richest biodiversity. Think about that. 20% get 80% of the biodiversity. What does this mean? Indigenous people are good stewards of the land. As much as we want to say that, oh, we respect the land. But this percentage, and you could do the research, it's 2023. There's an the internet. There's books, historical societies, or you can go to the tribe and ask, learn, educate yourselves. Why is it on indigenous people to educate you? Yes. Do you know how to read? Yes. My son is right there. He's learning to read right now. Why do we learn to read if we don't want to read the history? Or you know what? Better yet, like indigenous people, listen to the oral history. It's the most precious thing that we have, the oral history. Now, I want to ask a question, because there's a lot of fragility here, right? I learned about the Dakota people, not, and I've been here since I was six years old, on the land, the occupied lands of the Wapakute, and I never once learned anything of the Dakota people, not once, until I was in college at South Central North Mankato campus. Why? Why did I not learn about this through my teachers? What? I should have read, yeah. Was it in the books? It wasn't in the books. Exactly, did you teach your kids? I don't think so. 
Okay, now my question to the panel and to a lot of the community. If you want to talk, you can come up here and say your comments. Now another thing. I want to ask the panel. When people go to the cemeteries, right, we have a lot of Christian cemeteries. If people deface those tombstones, they get a ticket or they go to jail for defacing them, right? The indigenous people just want respect. They just want to honor their people, just like everybody else. And that's all I leave. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeremy Ellingbo. I grew up here in Granite. Um, I learned a lot about the Dakota people, the war. I mean, that was probably like one of my favorite things to learn about. And you know how I learned about that? By going out there. You actually get hands on, you can actually see see what the battlefield looked like. You get more of a grasp of it. You learn about like, glacial like, lake Agassiz, the river warm. You look off the bluffs, you, I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome. You can't replace that. Can, can you at least like, Open it up so that people could actually go you know, out and see that firsthand. Just a narrow way to get felt or to see that stuff. And this is history. We can't take that away. We, people need to learn about this stuff. That's how you learn. I grew up here, so you know I had friends of all races, and I've seen it's it's not people treating the land badly. It's it's a generational thing. I think the, this generation, the, the kids are, and even my 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 age people, they're. We used to go down fishing on the res down there, and people would destroy it. I was not one of them, but then they closed it off to anybody besides members, which, you know, it's, that's up to them, that's their land. I'm all for the land transfer, but this comes down to the government screwed up here again, the legislators. This should have came first. This meeting right here should have came first. How can anybody make up their mind without having this meeting first? Putting blame on people where they should be blamed? Smig, you're not to blame. <coughs> Kevin, you should have came forward and you, you know about this whole process the whole time. It's not a bad thing, but you, you could have just said, hey, people, you know, we want this. And a lot more people would have supported you. I mean, completely. It's, it's, you cannot put blame on Smig. You cannot. That's all I heard last night, too. There was a meeting at, at, at City Council last night and they just slammed him. You people, you know, it's not you people. That's teaching racism. It wasn't us, it was a government that did that back then. And that was a, a horrendous thing that they did. I mean, on both sides. The Dakota people stuck up for the people because they were they were stubborn. So they fought back, they protected their people. Whereas, the, and the government sent out troops, and what did the troops do? What they were ordered to do from the government. It was, it was wrong on both sides. And we need to learn from that. That's the only way we can learn from it, is, is keep that history alive. Teaching our kids that. So, I mean, Smig, you know, he, he's, Smig knows a lot about the history, the local history around here, probably more than anybody that I know. He likes, he likes to keep it up on that stuff. And putting blame on him is just completely wrong. So, what I like to know is like, okay, so if, if the land goes back to that pursuit, is anybody going to be hunting on, on that part of it? I understand it's sacred. <coughs> I'd like to respond to this, this assumption. Again, it goes back to the disinformation and misinformation that's been set forth by Mayor Smigluski as well as, uh, as Commissioner Behrens. I stated early on that on January 20th of, uh, of 2022, the Upper Sioux community made a request to Representative Swadzinski to sponsor this bill for the return of the state park to the Upper Sioux community. We also attempted to contact Senator Dames and we were unsuccessful. So for you to say that somehow I should have did this or I should have did that, I, I, I only can offer you that um, we made those overtures over 16 months ago. It is not incumbent upon us to, to 
nor are we subservient to the state of uh, Min or to the uh, state of Minnesota or its local unit of governments. That it's uh, we need to inform the county nor the city. And as I mentioned, in 18 years, I have had absolutely zero contact with uh, Mayor Smigluski and only two um, um, times that we ever had um, any interaction with the county. A bridge can be crossed two ways. And if something needs to be said or something needs to be discussed, we've never once demanded from the city or the county that they tell us what they are going to do or what they should or should not do. We did make the we outreach to the, the senator as well as the representative. And if that's not um, adequate enough, I, I don't know what more that we could have done. And I say that to each and every one of you. I find it incredulous that somehow this is now pointed a finger at, 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 at the Upper Sioux community. We were the ones who were up front. We were the ones who put this forth for 18 years. And just to clarify, uh, when, when I was approached by uh, Chairman Denzel, I didn't carry the bill, right? This bill has been around for 16 years or whatever the idea has been around for 16 years. and. Like I said, when we realized that this was actually something that wasn't just a bill of the 5,000 that get dropped in the state legislature, it was one that was actually going to move forward. Not just a conversation, but something that would likely happen. And the DNR and the governor's office, who they just stated three or four times tonight that they 100% support the transfer. Support it. And I'm sad that we're the ones picking up sticks here as your state rep and senator here. But that's what we're doing, right? We can have a town hall meeting about a thousand different issues. But this one is very important to our, our, our area and our district. And so that's why we're having it. And so, yes, we were asked in January, would you carry this bill? And I'm not carrying it. <coughs> and so, if it's my bill that I'm carrying, or Senator Dane's bill that we're carrying, yeah, we want to talk about it. We want to have a conversation. But when it's not, I think that's what gets folks a little riled up here too, is that when you have a, a state representative from Anoka, Minnesota, which is the northern part of the Twin Cities, carrying a bill on behalf of the tribe, and I talked to Kevin about this. I said, you know, because this conversation and communication is important. And how we handle that is important. And I told Kevin, I said, you know, if your own legislator who represents you in the state legislature, who I believe we have a good relationship with, as the bill is written, isn't willing to carry it, that should be a red flag. Because I don't think all the, T, the T's have been crossed and the I's have been dotted. Is there hurt in this room? Absolutely. Is there division in this room? Absolutely. But bills carried by members from across the state that affect someone else's district is not exactly how things are done in the legislature. And if I was carrying the bill, it might not look just the way it is. And so when you're given the task of picking up sticks, when something's probably going to move forward, when you have the governor in support, when you have members from across the state who maybe have been to Granite Falls, support. And then we're gonna pick up sticks. And that's what we're doing tonight. I'm glad the representative brought up that conversation we had as far as red flags. I, I told him, I said, we don't have any lobbyists. We are, we're not educated in, in, in the governing system of the state of Minnesota. We try to, to remain kind of distance from all of the fanfare and everything that goes on and we just try to be a good neighbor and fend for ourselves. You know, I hear this term grassroots and this literally what this effort was over all of these years that it finally at some point there were enough people willing to listen to the arguments that uh, the Upper Sioux Tribal Council was making and, it, and it, people took notice. And, and, and when he did mention this red flag, that did, and I mean no disrespect again because I, the protocols are very much different when it comes to 
the way that uh, the tribe um, conducts business and the state conducts business. But when Representative Swadzinski stated to me that, you know, it's a red flag if, if he wasn't willing to carry it, I, I, I felt a little saddened because as my representative as well, I, I thought that um, the Upper Sioux's argument had merit. And I truly believe that, that it was a good thing to do. But I also remember, and I'm not ignorant uh, of where I live, and I made mention to him that there are Republicans and there are Democrats, and that's unfortunate because this bill isn't about one side or the other. It is about humanity and society in general. And if it's a red flag because the tribe has attempted to get funds to recreate a state park and a recreational opportunity for Minnesotans and also to protect sacred tribal lands, you know, I thought that that was probably a good thing. If we laid it out in the simplest of terms and, and, and took the upper Sioux out of the equation to say, hey, this park is suffering, it's old and antiquated and you can't get to it anymore and we're gonna make a new one. I don't think this room would be as full as it was. And again, the red flag to me is that um, There must be some historical societal bias that exists that somehow the return of the sacred land is, 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 is offensive and is unjust. And that, that's the only conclusion I can draw, and I say that as an individual, and I apologize to the other council members and the other tribal members here, but, but, but that's the only conclusion I can, I, I can, I can come up with as to why that this is not a good thing. The state of Minnesota and its citizens will be getting a better park than the one that exists. I do want to mention about that horse camp. Uh, I do believe that that is a vital component. And I'm certainly, um, I certainly believe that uh, the Upper Sioux Tribal Council will support that effort to make sure that um, that's a component as we move forward. Because I did receive an email from a lady who said that her and her husband were the uh, caretakers of the horse camp for many years, and they expressed their, she said he is now passed on, but she expressed on his behalf his concern about the deterioration of, of, of the park itself. So again, we hear this term win-win, and, and I'm just saying that the only conclusion I can draw that why we are, 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 are biased against it has something to do with the, the people who are, are of the yellow medicine. Good evening. My name is Janelle Welling. I would like to take this time to just ask for all of us when we leave tonight to lay down our anger and think about walking in someone else's shoes. And I say that for the fact that I belong to Big Bend Lutheran Church out north by Big Bend, which is a very, very small community, but the river runs through it. That being the case, a few years back, Big Bend Lutheran Church Cemetery, which the river goes by, was eroding and getting very close to the cemetery. The concern was what will happen if that river has any more time on its hands to erode away and our forefathers and our loved ones' caskets start to float down the river. It was very, very important to preserve that. It was important. It was federal dollars, state dollars, local dollars all used. And as we go forward in time, I look around and I look at the demographics here. There are people who are my parents' age, grandparents' age, and I am 57 years old. And I look at the next generations, and what I see in our churches, of our small country churches, are these. When I was going to Big Bend Church as a kid, we had active members of 350 people. It was a thriving church. 
on Sunday morning, this last Sunday morning, as people got out in the spring, the uh, sun was upon us. We had 40 people and thought it was a great day. What is telling to me is the fact that with each of our small church congregations, there's a cemetery committee. And I really want you to think about that. Because our cemetery committee is assigned to take care of our cemeteries, not only now, but in the future. We watched that happen at Big Ben when I was a little kid. And we were once upon a time a four-point parish of Mont Lutheran Church, Jevenacher Lutheran Church, West Bank Lutheran Church, and Big Ben Lutheran Church. Mont closed. The cemetery is still there. And, it's, and over time, it's less and less people to care for it when it's been passed to the next generation because people have moved away. Same with Jebenacher has now had to close. West Bank, when they closed, they made the very, very difficult decision to have to do away with that church. And they have the cemetery that is standing there and people to care for it. The thing that we see is, as you have pointed out, the gal who said she rides horses, she's passionate about that. She knows she will take care of it. You know, sir, that you will take care of it. And you who, who can. The overall thing is this, is that, you know, each of us are burying loved ones, and we're burying them in our cemeteries. And it's important for us. Who's going to be our next caretaker? And maybe it hits more personal to me because... My grandmother was French Canadian Indian, and I never had the opportunity to meet her because she died when my dad was 17. But that being the case, I look at the Upper Sioux community, and I look and I think what I've always been in awe with is the fact that they make it a point from one generation to another to keep telling their stories, that it is threaded within their culture that the honor of their forefathers and the loved ones that have passed, that that is being sacred ground to them. That is their, and I don't mean disrespect when I say this, it's with all due respect. If we were to put it in our equal as Europeans, and I hate to separate us, we all have an area where we want to honor the loved ones that have passed on. When I look at the 20 million acres that we're taking and they're asking for 1400 and it isn't that it won't be replaced back. I appreciate that. But I ask when we go home tonight, as we go forward in our generations, I understand that the commitments that you have who have used the park, but I think the bigger picture is, is that all of us as people and as individuals are asking um, for each of us to have uh, a sacred honored ground for our loved ones and where we will be buried someday. So I ask that we consider, take that into consideration and I would be for the transfer. Thank you. We'll have a time, if we have time for a few more questions. Uh, <coughs> Hi, my name is Robin Moore. Uh, I am one of your constituents and I just want to speak out in favor of this land transfer and um, appreciate that we're having the space here tonight. I also just really want to offer to people um, let's come together and organize to make sure those acres are out here. Like this is just a chance to have more protected acres, to have more green space. We need this out here and I just really want to reiterate that any way we can. Um, so, thank you. Um, yeah, <clears throat> my name is Terry Vanderpaul. I, I didn't plan on speaking when it came today, but I, I realized that I thought I knew quite a bit about what happened in 1862 and the history of, the, of, of what we call the park. But I was really struck tonight. I learned something new when I heard uh, the chairman talk about it not being recreational uh, recreational land and I think that's right it's sacred land and I came here supporting the transfer and I
continue to support it for even stronger reasons. Now, it is sacred land. It should not be. It should not be considered recreational land. Yeah, I just want to talk real quick. My name is uh, Scott Demuth. Um, I'm a resident here in Grand Falls. I actually grew up in the cities, but uh, my wife brought me out here, so you can thank her for that one. Um, you know, so I'm uh, yeah, I'm a business owner. Um, I'm an investor here in this town, and actually owned uh, multiple commercial properties here in this town as well. And um, I live technically outside of the boundaries. I live, uh, you know, just up the road of the country on a little farm site out there. Um, but yeah, I want to first thank uh, Chairman Jensel. Just my time here, the 10 years living out here, um, you know, Upper Sioux has been good neighbors to Granite Falls. And I think that's what's been missing today. And I want to I want, I want lift that up and thank you for your leadership. Um, I lift weights uh, three times a week, usually at the KCC. I take my kids swimming there. And uh, every time I walk by that wall of all the people who sponsor that building, that institution here, I see Upper Sioux's name. You know, you talk about this plow too, right? Like, using your resources as a community to help out and be a good neighbor. And I think that's what's missing in this conversation is that if this land transfer goes through, I don't think that's gonna change Upper Sioux being a good neighbor to this community. And I think that's what's missing here today. This is the right thing to do. And this, is, this isn't this is gonna change, uh, I don't think, in terms of Upper Sioux's position of being good neighbors and being good stewards of that land. So I just wanna lift that piece up. Um, also to Senator Doms, thank you for organizing this. Um, you know, I have the privilege of working for the Land Stewardship Project, and you've been, uh, you know, you've been uh, pushing a lot of really good uh, bills uh, that I, I just want to lift up for people that might not know. Um, you've been supporting small-scale meat producers in this region. You, um, you've been pushing through uh, and acting on soil health, uh, small grains, diversified operations for small farmers. And uh, yeah, when the, the, the COVID pandemic hit, you also halted farm foreclosures, and you took a stance there regarding land loss. And so, you know, as LSP, we have 1,500 members and supporters in District 15 and 15A. We have another 4,400 members and supporters with an hour's drive of Upper Sioux State Park. And we want you to take a stance on this land loss. We want you to take a stance and support land return here to the Upper Sioux State Park. We want you to advocate for those acres, the replacement acres, to also be here in this river valley. So that's, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop there, that's my time. Um, but yeah, thank you for hosting this. I'm keeping it short. My name is Audrey Arner. I have lived and had the privilege of farming on Dakota traditional farmland for 50 years. I'm not from here, but I, as I came to understand the uh, true gift that that has been, uh, I realized that the biodiversity that is so re resplendent along the edge of the Minnesota River Valley, it was not given to the Dakota because it was rich in biological diversity. It was it's because it wasn't very farmable. And now it is the place to be. It is a, a, a it is a generous landscape. And as I think forward about that uh, the, the creation of a new space will not be a taking for anybody, that it will be a giving back to the people of Minnesota. And I, for one, and I know other farmers, landowners in the 10 miles on either side of the Minnesota Valley who would be happy to participate in just how it is we go about doing that. I've got a question for Kevin Jensel. I'm like Gary Lance from uh, Echo. And, and about three, uh, 30, back, uh, 30 years ago, I was talking to some uh, Native American elders. And they were telling me that, that the mouth of the Yellow Medicine River was, was, a, was a focal point for many tribes. They'd come here to, to dig a, a medicinal, uh, medicinal plants. And this was prior to that. Uh, this, this is back in the 1850s, 40s, 1700s. And uh, they compared it to a pipe stone. They, they, they were saying that, the, 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 that, the, that all these different tribes would come together and not fight. <coughs> they, they, they belonged to each other. And, and uh, I know I, I, I was actually, when they talked about it, they, uh, but when, they, when, they, when they put in the campground down there, they found, uh, they found camp, uh, campfires from 10,000 years ago. 
they did uh, shovel digs. And there were some of the more, uh, most intense pottery charge anywhere in the state. Is this, a, 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 is this history that's a, a correct? Gavin. It's good to hear your voice again. I haven't seen you in a, in a long time. You know, again, as Dakota people, we're identified by, by places for the most part. And, and, you know, that's how we got our name. The Blue Moon Seed, as far as I know, it is that sacred yellow medicine. People ask that quite often. Why, why is it? Well, at the confluence of the Minnesota and the Yellow Medicine River was the one place. And, and I look over there behind the, the, the podium over there, and I, and I'm probably a better expert on, on traditional medicines and histories was Itawi's husband there. But, um, you know, this was the single place that we would gather that and bring it to the summer camps, and we became identified as those people where they gathered the yellow medicine. Pajutisikapi Makoche Oyate, the people where they dig the yellow medicine. So this predates the European, and as far as um, the botany and all of that, to Gary Lentz is a tremendous asset. Anybody who doesn't know him, he is, knows most of the medicines, and we rely on him for his um, his knowledge as well. You know, but um, I, I can't speak to the, the the spiritual nature of it. You know, those those are reserved for for the 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 Wakawi Chasha and the Yupiawi Chasha as to how they utilize those things that we could uh, live a better healthy life but it was our pharmacy you know and everything in this land we knew had importance and that yellow medicine was very important as far as the overall health of our people um, uh, hello, my relatives. It's with a good heart that I greet all of you with a handshake. I am Wazi Antoui, and I'm from Jiu uh, Um You know, I'm a historian by training, so this the history of the site is um, something I've invested a lot in, in studying and learning about over the years, and, and also sharing. Um, in 2019, uh, I completed a history of our community and I don't know maybe the tribal council will make that available to interested people if you would like to, to learn more about who we are um, but I just I want to address uh, one thing in particular and that's the issue of I guess justice and how central land is to that and Usually, there can't be a win-win situation because if someone takes land, someone else loses land. That's that's usually how it works. That's how it worked for our people. We were the, um, uh, and as our chairman, Jens Wilt, has already said, you know, no one here is responsible for what happened in 1862 or what happened in the 1860s. No one here is to blame. But everyone here is responsible for the legacy of that. And I will tell you that there hasn't been a single generation of Minnesotans who have committed to doing the right thing in regards to Dakota people. And that everyone here, everyone who lives in, in Minnesota Makoche, in our beloved homeland, is a beneficiary of genocide and of land theft. Our people paid the price so that you could be here. And um, you know, I was tickled when I walked in the door and, and was handed this land back, this land back card, because you know I, I, this is put up by here, I guess. At least it's according to the bottom, and uh, I was tickled to see that. I'm very pleased to see that because it's an awareness, uh, a different consciousness about where we are in the United States, and an understanding that this is part of a, a growing movement. And I would say not just in the United States, but anywhere indigenous populations have lost their homelands and been colonized. And, you know, many of us as Dakota people consider ourselves to be living under occupation, under colonial occupation, because most of what we do is illegal within our homeland. And, um, and we have to fight and struggle just to get basic rights. And so 
I'm someone who's, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, one of our Wachvetu and Dakota leaders was named Mazomani, and he's my great, great, great grandfather. And once I reached adulthood, I made the decision that I would never pay state park fees again. Um, I was not going to pay to visit my grandfather's grave. I was not going to pay to pray in that place. And it is a place that I've used for ceremony. I've fasted in that state park. But every time we've done that, we've had to ask permission. Americans are so proud of claiming this is the best country in the world because of freedom. Freedom of religion is assumed, is taken for granted. Not for us. We have to ask permission. We have to get permits. We have to pay sometimes. And the idea of having this land returned to Dakota people is uh, a basic act of justice. Um, the vast majority of Dakota people still live in exile because of Minnesota's policies of genocide and ethnic cleansing. The vast majority of our relatives who, who have a, a right to this land, who were part of the 1851 treaties, some of them have never even been back here. They haven't been able to come back to our homeland. We have very basic needs. Um, in 2019, when I did that history of Upper Sioux, one of the things I realized in my research was that even when our reservation was first established in the 1930s, we had a land shortage. We didn't have enough land to support the population. That's still true today in 2023. We don't have land for housing. We don't have land for our people for food production, major food production. So we have basic needs, basic needs that are still denied today and having access to, you know, a land base that would essentially double our land base um, would really help our community, would help our people. So, you know, I didn't, I think, have the perspective that I have now. I, I you know, it's experience that taught me some of this. And one of the experiences that I remember was being in southern Colorado and uh, in Ure or one of the towns there where they had hot springs. And um, my husband and I were traveling through there and we stopped and we were enjoying the hot springs. And then I was looking at the hotel where these hot springs, you know, they were marketing them as part of their um their capitalist venture, but when I read the history of that site that the hotel was publishing, they were talking about it being, um, you know, those springs were considered sacred by the Ute people, and but they were, you know, forced off their lands, and you know, they're somewhere else now. They aren't here, and so when we were there, there were no Ute people, not a single one, and. I remember looking at the signs for the you know, National Forest, tens of thousands of acres in Southern Colorado. And I thought, with all those thousands of acres, they can't make room, can't make space for you people to live there in their homeland and enjoy their um, the traditional hot springs and, and that have medicinal and healing value to them. And then I thought, well, it's the same in Minnesota, isn't it? And since Minnesota has uh, been under settler colonial occupation. Settler, white settler recreation has been privileged over Dakota survival, Dakota basic needs. And I see this as another example of that. Uh, people are concerned about their loss of recreational space. I'm sorry, I think our, our right to sacred sites, our right to pray, our right to honor our ancestors, all should be prioritized over white people's recreation. I'm sorry to take your time again. However, pardon? Um, the previous speaker before you is also a member of the Cavender family who has spoken here several times. We share something. We are both uh, victims of each other's cultures and communities. She 
has been investigated by the United States government for threats of violence. I have received and came here tonight under death threat from the Dakota communities. But there's one important thing here that I think many are missing, and that comes from the younger generation. The youngest speakers here tonight are the ones who display the most understanding and the least understanding. And I think that that proves that this is not the time for the legislators leaders to step in and complete this transfer. And I don't think it's the right time for the tribe to work for this transfer. It needs time. I thank you all for your attention tonight and your concern. We'll have one quick speaker and then we'll wrap it up. Hi, I'm Bruce Meyer. I'm from southwestern Minnesota. I don't have a dog in this fight. I know a lot of friends and I have people here that I'm familiar with. But um, what I see when I look around is a lot of details and a lot of people are out in the weeds thinking about this thing or that thing. And I used to snowmobile here. I used to ride horse here. And I kind of feel like it should be mine and to use as I want. And uh, when I look around, I see whether you're Native American or if you're immigrants or children and descendants of immigrants, we're all people who like to think of ourselves as owning up to the statement as, I like to be fair, what's right is right. And I think if we think about the history of what's gone on here, how this land belonged to one people and then they lost it by force, and now they would like some of it back not all of it, just a little bit of it that's sacred to them. How can we refuse that? Um, what's fair is fair. I think that we can all look into our own hearts and look at the history and go, yeah, we've had it pretty good, we've, we've used it, but maybe it's time to recognize that for the same reason we don't have picnic areas in Auschwitz and we don't have soccer tournaments in Fort Snelling Cemetery, this land should probably go back. The next, the DNR is going to give us a little summary of the process from here on out, or the next steps. And then we'll have a panel make uh, real short closing comments, and then Chris and I will make a few comments, and we'll wrap her up. Um, I just wanted to let people know, as we have mentioned both, um, Scott and I, that we are working and engagement with the Minnesota Historical Society also and others um, in this process. We are finalizing an engagement plan. We're going to engage again with the county board and make sure that we have all the pieces and parts of it put together. Um, and um, we will pull that together and make it available for everybody. We'll probably create um, something that's called a gov delivery so that if you want more information, you can get on that and you, know, you will get all the information. But we'll also have other ways of getting that information through paper and public um, announcements so that people will know what the public process will be. We'll go ahead and have each panelist just make a quick one minute uh, close here and we'll start with the captain. Thank you, Senator Dames, uh, Representative Suzinski, good thing I don't want to watch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm already 20 seconds in. But, but I'm, I'm grateful to everybody, you know, no matter what your opinion or your viewpoint, I've never seen this many people all together. I would welcome, and I think the council would welcome any other questions you have, because there's probably 500 questions in here that haven't been answered. And I do believe that, you know, you know when me, people mention about uh, who we are and, and wonder who we are, I, I make that overture to each and every one of you, you know, to, to, to make the effort to contact us. I look on the website, I have a cell phone number, you can call me anytime, I'll do my best to uh, Everybody knows that uh, the 549 <laughs> tribal members know that I like to talk a lot. So by uh, all means, you know, give me a call. And to everybody here, uh, again, I'm, I'm very grateful. And Senator Dames and Representative, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you offered this opportunity again because 
to clarify where our position was and, and how this legislation came to be. I guess it's not just, you know, in the last little while, it's been a long effort on behalf of the yellow medicine people. And again, we extend our, you know, appreciation, you know, for any considerations and any uh, assistance that can uh, move forward with this um, return of sacred land. I say mitaki owasi, you know, all around this universe we're related. Uh, Scott Raymel, thank you for being here. Uh, you're here because you care. And the last four weeks in a row, I've, I've made trips to Granite Falls. I'm going to be making a lot more trips to Granite Falls, and I look forward to more conversation. Uh, I also want to thank you all for coming and for your comments and for your questions. And I look forward to further engagement, and I also will be making more trips to Granite Falls. I also want to thank the Senator and the Representative for pulling this together, and the panel members also. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Ben Leonard with the Minnesota Historical Society. Thank you for coming out tonight. Really appreciate the Upper Sioux community and the DNR as uh, partners, and look forward to this process. David Kelleher, Minnesota Historical Society. I'm heartened to hear that nearly all of the speakers tonight talked about their respect and curiosity about history. And I think there, as Ben said earlier, there are many, many ways to learn about history. We can learn from each other. There are lots of other ways, but let's keep doing that. Let's keep learning. Let's keep talking. And thanks to our legislators for getting us together. And I would echo that thank you to Senator Deems and Representative Swinsinski. This is Dave Spigluski. Um, the Friends for Upper Zoo Agency State Park believe that the park is a great public place of very great importance in Minnesota history, which is available <coughs> for all Minnesotans to enjoy, to find peace, and to study the rich historical, cultural, and natural heritage of our area. We believe the park should remain available to all Minnesotans, regardless of their race or their beliefs, so that we can learn, understand, and heal from those very tragic events that happened there. And so we can pass that on to future generations. I'm not going to live forever. None of us will live forever. But we help our kids and our grandkids will come to understand how we got here, why we're here, and what happened before that made this place so very special. Maintaining that park as a public entity is, in our opinion, key to that. And I call on the tribe and the DNR and the Historical Society to work together collaboratively to help us all learn and heal from that. Um, if land is replaced, if that happens, what reassurance do we have that any replacement land that is purchased from, I assume, a willing seller will be in our area. And that's very, very important. Or none of this 
discussion really matters if it isn't here. It's not to buy a pine forest up north. It's to preserve recreation and outdoor enjoyment in this wonderful river valley. So I urge that to be foremost on our minds as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, this is John Behrens, uh, County Commissioner from the Old Madison County, and I, I think, um, you know, uh, there's a danger of, of this topic creating even more division between peoples that live here. And um, one of the papers reported on our uh, last board meeting did quote me on that. Um, that was the Marshall paper. The rest of them didn't bring that up as my number one concern. Um, number two, um, as Chairman Jenswell brought up, there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. I'd like to clear some of those things up. I never did get a chance to add, answer the, some of the questions and get the microphone to this end of the table. Um, but um, the county didn't vote on, on this. It isn't for the county to vote. And the Marshall paper did say it's between the tribe and the state. But who is the state? I mean, the state is all of us people. All of us are the state. We all own an asset. And to have somebody um, um, leave us out of the discussion. Now, I'm not playing, playing, pointing fingers at, at Upper Sioux or Chairman Jenswell. It's not their duty to, 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 to uh, inform us at the county board or at the city or, or in the, as the public. But it is the duty of our publicly elected officials and appointed um, bureaucrats to keep us informed and to keep us and to bring us into the conversation because they work for us. Sometimes you guys forget about that. And uh, you know, it's, it's up for us to remind those folks that they work for us. Um, there's been three governors. It's not a partisan issue. There's been both sides of the aisle that have been working at. They've never contacted anybody locally to bring us into the conversation. And so, you know, um, the governor is probably in place to, 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 to say where the breakdown in communication was, because he's been working on this the longest of the people that are in, in, uh, in there, other than the, the tribe that's been working on it. 18 years, but it's not their obligation. So hopefully we can not fall into the trap of division. We can become stronger through this. Um, there is no guarantee. This is not pointed out very strongly here tonight, but there is no guarantee.